being married, y'all. This thing, I'm telling you, it weighs. Okay. <laughs> but I love my wife forever. <laughs> Not really, I do. Okay. Um, we, whatever that day was, Tuesday, yes. um, we were talking about production possibilities. We were looking at for Haley, she could either be asleep or be awake. How is she going to spend her day? She can be completely asleep all day long. She can be completely awake all day long or some spot in between. Then we talked to Lestara and she horrifyingly was only awake for like, only sleep three hours during that day. And that was just like, hard. you look better rested today. Yeah. I've got to say. <laughs> uh, so then uh, I threw up an example. I just had the numbers that kind of blew past it because we were running out of time. But for this example, a farm, you know, they could do nothing but wheat, in which case they could plant enough plants to get a thousand bushels of wheat, or they could go all in with corn and get 500 bushels of corn, or they could do some combination in between. And I sort of left y'all hanging there. But the fun thing that I want to talk about right now is it ain't a straight line like this, like we had when we were talking about time, because it's not necessarily one to one ratio. In this case, okay, it's sort of like maybe two, two wheat plants versus one corn plant, but still, it ain't a straight line. Because if you were going to get rid of some wheat and start planting corn, what wheat are you going to get rid of? The worst wheat that you have, right? So if you were to get rid of 10% of your wheat plants, are you going to be getting rid of 10% of your overall wheat production? Probably not. If you had a business and you had 10 employees, which one, and you got to fire one of them, which one are you going to let go? The worst one. The worst one. Whose name is? I'm thinking Sam, but we'll just Sam. <laughs> Sam. Congratulations. So you would get let go of Sam. Why? Because Sam was the worst worker you had. I'm sorry, Sam. But <laughs> look up. There's the bottom of a bus just over your head. Uh, Sam was the worst worker you had. So by getting rid of one of you 10 workers, are you dropping down to only getting 90% of the work done? No. no, because he wasn't doing jack anyway, right? So maybe labor costs drop by 10%, but the actual amount of work getting done only drops by 1% or 2%. Well, that's kind of the same thing there. you got two ways it's going to happen. Number one, you could get rid of the worst wheat plants. Or number two, you're going to start planting the corn in the areas where the corn is going to grow the best, right? So either way, when you start switching from wheat to corn, you're not going to lose that much wheat, but you are going to gain a good amount. Of, excuse me, I should go on your. You're not going to lose that much wheat, but you are going to gain an interesting amount of corn right off of the bat, right? And then the more you go, okay, we can make a, little, a bunch more corn without giving up a whole lot of wheat there. So what do you think? That sounds like a winner there, right? So, okay, now maybe we can go a little bit farther, give up a little bit more wheat, Ooh, but we got to give up a little bit more, but we get even more corn. So is switching from wheat only to growing part wheat and part corn, does that start looking like a good idea? Probably. Yeah, um, I was about to say setting aside the actual prices at the moment, just that's just a little minor detail, just, but true. If corn is selling for a penny a bushel and wheat is selling for $20 a bushel, yeah, you're all in with wheat, right? But if the prices are similar or something like that, then you're know, stepping down may be the way to go. Hypothetically, yeah, because you're still, like, even at your maximum of each one, you're making twice as much wheat as you are corn. No, because if you're here, you're making no corn. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, at oh, yeah. your max, at either side, you're making twice as much wheat yeah. as just, your maximum corn. Oh, okay. You, you know, <laughs> let's assume, let's see. Wheat is $3 a bushel. Corn, $6 a bushel. If you do nothing but wheat, 1,000 bushels, $3 a piece, how much money are you bringing in? $3,000. <laughs> if you did nothing but corn, you get 3000 right? Well, what about right here, if you want here? Uh -huh. At this point here, we're only produ we're producing, call it 800 wheats, 
instead of a thousand, oh, we're doing 300 cars. 300 times six is six, 12, 1800, and then 18 times three is 24, right? So 18 and 24, 34, 40, 200. We're gonna go with that, all right? Does this look good? Yeah. Yes, score. That's what you ought to do. That's kind of what you, our considerations are. So, okay, so then you start, remember, okay, marginal cost, marginal benefit. What is the extra benefit to growing more core? How much extra money would we get? But what's the marginal cost? How much less wheat are we gonna get? Right? We gave up $600 worth of wheat in order to get $1,200 worth of corn, right? But we're willing to do that, right? So then we're thinking, well, maybe we need to get rid of a little bit more wheat and maybe we need to get a little bit more corn, right? But of course, you can go too far to where you start ending up down here somewhere. Right, to where, yeah, okay, maybe you get 400 of the corn, but you're only getting 500 of the wheat. So what's happening there? That's 15 and 6, 12, 24 and 15 is, that's 44, right? No. 24 and 15, 34, 35, 36, 39. 3,900. That's worse than 42, right? Apparently you went too far. It's better than 3,000, but just so what do we got to do? Oh, we did too much corn, not enough wheat this year. We need to back it off. Okay, next year, same here. Dirty little suit. What we're going to get to at the end of this? No, in Econ 202 next semester, we're going to end up coming up with the where on this point is the perfect place to play. Given the numbers we have out here, somewhere right here near the middle is going to be that perfect point. But it really depends on the price. If wheat was thirty dollars and corn was six, where's the best place to be? All wheat, right? All wheat all the time, right? <laughs> so it just depends on and how those prices move, how those change. It may move you if instead of three dollars, this went up to three fifty. Then maybe instead of operating here, maybe over here is going to be the best place to be. Okay, say this is the price you decided on. Um, a little bit of corn, some wheat, then after you plant two months later, the price change. In that case, welcome to farming. Your host, <laughs> you're host. <speak>. You're stuck. <laughs> yes. Um, I've got a student in my marketing class. He's in a couple of these agriculture classes. His family does soybean farming. And we talked about what happened to soybeans a week ago in here, right? The price is low, but guess what? The price was high when they planted. And the expectation was it was going to be a good price. That's why they went in with the soybeans again this year. And what happened? Uh, they got shafted because in the middle of the planting season, you can't start digging up wheat and planting more corn. And that's part of the reason why it's a stinking tough to be a farmer. So, here again, maybe you diversify. Maybe we, you know, on a good price year for wheat, well, if we're doing half, half wheat, half corn, well, we might not take advantage of the full opportunity of a really expensive wheat. But we don't get messed over on those years where the price of wheat really drops, right? So if we do half and half, hopefully one of the two of them is going to do okay and we'll come out okay. It ain't like hitting a home run every time we go up to bat, but I'll take a double every time I go up to bat other than you know, an occasional home run and an occasional out. Because there's outs mean I can't feed my family this year, right? So, you baseball players, you know, so. Was expecting to go into any of that, but okay. I <laughs> oh, uh, don't like it, vibration there. Okay. I'm afraid I can break something. Okay. So, that was an example for a farm, for an economy as a whole. Products really can be lumped together as being goods or services. And so you can be an economy that concentrates on providing nothing but goods. There's a physical object that so you can pick up and throw at somebody and they'll at least feel it. Maybe it'll hurt or maybe it won't. Or maybe it's too heavy to pick up. Or services. Or you can do a combination of the two. In the United States, our economy is tending more toward services than it is toward goods. Because 
as we talked about the other day, we have a hard time competing against people that can manufacture something and ship it overseas. That service can't be shipped overseas. Some of it can, some of it can't. Teaching, yeah, I could be replaced by somebody in India or somewhere through the internet teaching you this class. But how about the waiter or waitress that's bringing your steak out and setting it on a table in front of you at a restaurant? Somebody from China can't bring your steak out of the kitchen and set it on your table, right? So we're tending, it, our economy has been drifting more and more and more in this direction over time. And what defines what you do is land, labor, capital, knowledge that we talked about a week ago. What do you have to work with? It's gonna help define where you go on this process. So, and where should you end up, ideally? Somewhere in the middle, somewhere. China, yeah, they'd be leaning more on the goods and the services. Um, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Ooh, <laughs> you almost got me there. Okay. It, there, there's an example for you. Well, maybe you do a combination and that's going to get you 14 trillion instead of 12 for a 10. Right. I'm going to start an example. I'm going to go away from the example and then I'm going to come back. Here's your backyard. Who can I pick on? I've already picked on you, Sam. Jenny, okay. Oh, oh. No. Yeah, no, but I'm like trying to say, did I officially pick on you the other day when we were talking about the other man? So, okay, I'm like, I've already picked on Jenny a little bit, so man, congratulations. So, man has 10 yards, 10 acres with backyard. Let's just keep this simple. Remember this is Terrace Paribus, keep it simple. He can only grow tomatoes and watermelon. Nothing else will grow. And bizarrely enough, let's assume he can only have one tomato plant per acre, one watermelon plant per acre. Let's just keep the math simple, okay? So he has the combinations that we talked about the other day. He could plant all 10 acres in tomatoes. He could plant all 10 acres in watermelons, or he could do, I don't know, five and five, three and seven, two and eight. He's got all those options that we talked about. We have one and nine. In this case, you can't exactly do the one and a half, eight and a half, because I lied to you and so, um, said one plant per acre. And then that's where, for those of you that weren't here, Jenny, you slacked her the other day. All these points that are on the line are the different combinations of watermelons and tomatoes he can do. And if he's on the line, he's efficiently producing. He's using all the land he has available. If he's inside the line, he's got 10 acres to work with and he only plants seven of them. That's inefficient. But he can't exactly go out here and plant 20 acres worth of crops on a 10 acre farm. Because tomato plants don't grow very well trying to balance themselves on top of a watermelon. Right? Try it sometime. So, what does Matthew do? All watermelons, all tomatoes. Okay. If we're talking money, thank you, Sam, because he gave me this answer before I knew I was going to get it. It depends on the price. How much money can Matt get for watermelons, Matthew? How much money can Matthew get for the tomatoes? And that would define what he would do. But what if Matt was growing this for himself and money had nothing to do with it? Whatever he would want, whatever he would like. So, okay, let's just take this the extra absurd step. Matthew, it's 10 acres. We have a hurricane, not hurricane, earthquake. His 10 acres worth of property breaks off and drifts out into the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, no. It broke pretty far off. <laughs> yes. So guess where most of the rest of us are? Underwater, right? We got some issues. So he's out there in the water, out in the What's he going to do? Which tomatoes or watermelons? Or a combination? A combination. Why? Because we need tomatoes for food. We need watermelons. So that way you got tomatoes and watermelons no matter what. You have tomatoes, watermelons, you have stability, you have, that comes from diversification, you have variety, and that, that's where I was getting to for you psychology majors, not psychos, but you psychology majors. <laughs> uh, you, the, human beings like variety. How, 
he likes watermelons more than tomatoes, right? He likes watermelons more than tomatoes. But if he's eating watermelon day after day after day, watermelon for breakfast, watermelon for lunch, watermelon for afternoon snack, watermelon for supper, watermelon for the midnight snack, how just what the right? I'm tired by lunch. No. <laughs> so it if he had tomatoes too, well he could have watermelon for breakfast, tomatoes for lunch. He could start doing things where, I don't know, he takes some watermelon juice and tomato juice and mixes them together and he's got some kind of drink and I don't know. We, we as human beings like more variety. That's why I think when we were picking on Janie the other day, she likes the m and M. Oh, I think it was you, you like the M&M's more than, or Love Lane, okay. Love Lane likes M&M's more than anything, but that's her favorite food in that machine, but sometimes she goes to that machine and buys something other than M&M's. We like variety. And then you have that stability of, well, if one crop goes, if I'm all in on watermelons and then something happens to the watermelon crop, I host. Right? So, in either case, if it's just you, still variety makes sense. Setting aside the money, if money was an issue, you play somewhere in the middle. Okay, there may be the labor consideration, which we're going to be coming to here in a little bit. But if money's not an issue, well, maybe he's just going to do variety, and he might lean more toward the watermelons and the tomatoes, but he's going to have some tomatoes to keep from going completely insane and turning into a sociopath like somebody else whose name will go and mention Jenny. Um, <laughs> but if money is an issue, well, then maybe he can go all in with watermelons. Maybe he can go all in with tomatoes, but then maybe he's going to want to have that little bit of a safety net in case one crop goes bad or the other. It can be complicated, but it doesn't have to be. So. When is economic growth? One of our eight economic goals in the first day of class. I saw that on the Yawning. It's asleep, not the class. <laughs> it's asleep, not the class. Thank you for that. Okay. Economic growth, one of eight economic goals. Economic growth can be seen as an outward shift in our production possibilities curve. We can do more than we could before. If our economy is growing, we can produce more goods than we could before. We can produce more services than we could before. We can grow more tomatoes than we could before. We can grow more watermelons than we could before. That would be a visible sign of economic growth. If you can do more, your curve is naturally going to show it. If Matthew somehow, he either A, got more acreage, B, he came across some fertilizer, something like that, either way, he would be able to produce more watermelons than he could before. He could produce more tomatoes than he could before. Is that growth? Yes. And if he's running a company, if he's doing more work, he could hire more people because he needs more people to do the work because there's more work to be done, right? Getting the economy growing even more. So. Visually speaking, since I didn't actually do the curve, do a graph, I thought I did. But for you OCD people and completed people, that's economic growth, right? You visual learners. You can, we used to be able to do 10, 10 trillion, now we can do 13 trillion worth of goods, or we can do 16 trillion worth of services, or whatever combination in between. We were doing this, and now we can do this. We've got more. If Paley, one of her goals in life, and you know who it is, and I'm gonna hit, that she could. Oh, that didn't. Here it is. Paley wants to cheat time. She wants to go. Oops. If only she could do this. Right? Get more than 24 hours worth of stuff done in a day. I know the star was looking for that on Tuesday. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> three hours worth of sleep. Uh, so if she had 21 hours worth of awake stuff to do, she would have been nice if Tuesday was a 30 hour day and she could have gotten some sleep. Right? Good luck with that. Let me know how it turns out. There is some um, countries that have, you know, two months of the sun. Yes, yeah, even like um, Alaska and them all, then just, uh, yeah, just, just uh, that's a long night, but guess what? You ain't sleeping during that night. You're just, 
and you're being careful where you're walking and you only walk on designated trails because the ice flow is coming in and then it so part of what's going to define is America let me make sure I it's a good one okay are we going to concentrate on goods or services is China going to concentrate on goods and services? Are we going to concentrate on growing soybeans? Are we going to concentrate on growing tomatoes? Are we going to concentrate on growing oranges? Are we going to concentrate on making cars, making chainsaws? What's going to help to make that decision for us is where do we have an advantage? Because we are not alone. We are not like Matthew whose 10 acre farm has drifted off in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? What we can do is start recognizing there are things that I can do better than other people. There are things that I can do with a small and then making a smaller sacrifice than for other people. And that advantage is something that I can take advantage of. Maybe. And so we call it a comparative advantage. The comparative advantage or word of comparative is compare. What is it costing you compared to somebody else? And the way we look at this is it's your sacrifice. It is your opportunity cost. What are you not doing? How many, how many tomatoes does Matthew have to give up if he's going all in with watermelons? That might be different than Connor, how many tomatoes he'd have to give up to go all in on watermelons. Because it, Connor's got a 10 acre farm, Matthew's got a 10 acre farm. But Matthew's 10 acre farm is on the side of a hill where Connor's 10 acre farm is flat. Maybe watermelons grow better on Connor's farm, tomatoes don't grow very well on his farm, so it's not gonna cost him a whole lot to get rid of tomato plants to go all in on watermelons, right? He's only gonna have to chop down two or three tomato plants to go all in with watermelons, or maybe Matthew is gonna have to chop down more than that to go all in on watermelons. So what is the sacrifice? What is the opportunity cost? And that's what's defining your advantage. It's not how fast you can do it necessarily or how well you can do it, but it's how much is your sacrifice compared to others. You end up with the same result. Mostly you end up with the same results when you're looking at who can do it the fastest, who can do it the best, but we're looking at it in the opposite direction. There's something called absolute advantage is when your sacrifice is smaller than everybody's. Okay, comparative advantage. Luke isn't here today. We can talk about Luke again. What was it costing Luke to take this class? $350 worth of tuition? Plus, he was giving up like, what, $500, $600 worth of pay to be here. Compared to, let's see, who, who have I not picked on? Huh? Haley, I picked on her the other day. Did Amanda, have I picked on you yet? Sort of, okay. <laughs> okay. Who? Connor, I already talked about him. <laughs> I talked about him a little bit. I'm coming back to him, so he's not off the hook. So, so, uh, so Amanda, compared to Luke, Amanda, oh no, who? I can't remember who. Was, I, I had somebody in here the other day. Didn't have a job. Didn't have friends. Didn't, oh, it was Amanda. Yes. yes. Doesn't have a job. Doesn't have friends. Doesn't have a life. Doesn't have hobbies. So, what was she giving up in order to come to class? Almost nothing. Does that give her an advantage over Luke? Yeah. She doesn't have as much stress going on in her life when it's time to study. He's giving up stuff when it's time to study. He's giving up stuff to come to class. Apparently, he didn't give it up today, right? He's got something that kept him from coming to class today where Amanda had nothing keeping her from coming to class today, right? She could even say, well, I'm tired. I'm sleeping late because, hey, the class starts at noon, right? Seriously? And then you all sleep until you can't make a noon class. Oh, so her... Sacrifice is smaller than his. That gives him an advantage. Preston has an even better advantage. He's on, he, he's on financial aid, so he didn't even have to pay the $350. He only lives down the street, so he doesn't even have to drive here. Right? And he is 
He's got blackmail information out of people that run the lunch counter down there, so he gets free food every day. So he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any. What is his sacrifice to come here? Absolutely. Nothing. He's got blackmail information on me, so he's going to finish his class with an A. What's it costing him? Nothing. He's got the advantage over everybody. A man ain't giving up a whole lot to be here. Luke's giving up an interesting amount to be here. Lestar's giving up a lot to be here because she could be home with the babies, right? I don't care how old they are, they're still your babies, right? Just, just, I'm just saying. So, compared to Luke, Amanda has the advantage. But compared to Preston, Amanda doesn't have the advantage. Preston has the advantage. Preston would have the absolute advantage if his sacrifice to come here was lower than everybody's. That gives him the absolute advantage. But compared to advantage, Amanda has an easier time than some of y'all, has a harder time than some of you. Luke has an easier time than a couple of you, a harder time than a couple of you. Lestara has the hardest time of everybody because she's got a job that keeps her only sleeping three hours a day and she's got children that she could be spending. She's got the biggest sacrifice of everybody to be in here. Notice, I didn't say who's the best student. Notice, I didn't say who gets the best grades. It's not about how well you perform in the classroom. It's what are you giving up to get to the classroom. That's what we're discussing here. That's the difference between when we're talking comparative advantage versus what you would be thinking of. If I was to, normally before, 10 minutes ago, if I would ask you who's got the advantage in this class, y'all be sitting there, who's got the highest IQ, right? And who's got who, how many of you got that 4.0 grade point average? Okay, I'll let me get my middle fingers ready. No. <laughs> uh, I didn't have the 3.0. I didn't even have the 2.5. I ain't lying to y'all like, what the crap are you doing teaching? <laughs> so, you got the concept of what we're doing here. It's why you sacrifice to be here. Example, Ashlyn, she can fix a sink in two hours. Ashley can do her taxes because she did take the federal taxation class here, accounting 263, I think. Does it be added? Yes, we have a federal taxation one and two class here. Or maybe 241, 242, I can't remember. Anyway, she's taking the accounting class. She can do her own 1040 form, but it takes her eight hours to do it. Takes her eight hours to do it, but she can do it. But she can fix the sink in two hours. Where Barry, he can fix the sink. He can fix his own sink, but it takes him eight hours to fix the sink. But he can knock out a tax form in an hour. Good for him. So in a given day, do I have it on the next slide? Okay. In a given day, what happens? As she could do during an eight-hour workday, she could do as many as four sink repairs. Or she could do one tax return. And this is her production possibilities curve. If she spends half the day working on her taxes, then that only gives her enough time to do two sink repairs, right? She would be, this is gonna be her production possibilities curve. Where for Barry, he could fix one sink in a day, or he could do as many as eight tax returns in a day. So, where's the advantage? The advantage that y'all want to say on this last slide is, which is true, Barry can do a tax faster than her. He's got the advantage. She can do a sink faster than him. She's got the advantage. But when we're talking comparative advantage, the way I want you to think about it is it's not how long for Ashley, it's not how long this is, what gives her the comparative advantage is how short this is. She only has to give up one sink repair, I mean, excuse me, she only has to give up one tax return to become a plumber. What would Barry have to give up in order to become a plumber? He would have to give up the opportunity of doing eight people's taxes. To become a plumber, he's gotta give up eight tax returns. That's a bigger sacrifice than her. So her sacrifice is only one. That is her comparative advantage, how small this is.
That's your comparative advantage for becoming a plumber. Barry's comparative advantage comes right here for being an accountant. Barry would only have to give up one sink repair if he decided to become an accountant, where Ashley would have to give up four of them. So he's shorter here. That gives him the advantage when it comes to being an accountant. You'll see the difference there. You're like, well, you say the same thing. Why are you complicating things? Well, because the world's a complicated place. And we have a few, well, a few OCD people. As she has a comparative advantage for sinks, she only has to give up a quarter of a tax return in order to do her sink. She's got to give up only what, four of them to become a plumber, where Barry would have to give up eight tax returns in order to do her sink. Her sacrifice is much smaller to be a plumber. Barry has the comparative advantage in taxes. He only has to give up one eighth of a sink repair in order to do a tax return where Ashley would have to give up four. So what should they do? Oops, I doubled that. What should they do? Oh, okay. Let me get some numbers in here. Ashley has a comparative advantage for sinks. Barry has a comparative advantage for taxes. Let's assume Ashley charges $100 to fix a sink. Barry charges $200 to do a tax return. So when the dust settles, if Ashley says, well, I'm going to take the day off from work and I'm going to do my taxes. She's avoiding having to pay Barry $200 to do her taxes for her, right? I'm saving $200 by doing my own taxes. But what could she be doing instead with that day? She could be making $400 fixing sinks. So what should she do? Go out, fix four sinks, make $400, give $200 of it to Barry, and he takes care of her taxes. And she's got $200 to spare, right? Or she could say, well, I'm only gonna, I only need $200 to pay Barry, so I'm going to work a half a day, do two sink repairs, get enough money to pay Barry to fix my sinks, and then i got half a day to go hang out with my friends at the lake. Right? Those are the options she gets if she says, I'm going to specialize in what I have the comparative advantage in. I'm going to be a sink plumber, and I'm not going to waste my time trying to do taxes because it's not to my benefit. With Barry, when his, when his sink gets stopped up, he's going to say, well, I could spend all day trying to fix my sink, and that means that's eight tax returns I can't do. That's $1,600 that I could make that I ain't making because I'm too cheap to call Ashley to come in and fix my sink. I don't want to pay her $100. What should he do with his day? He should either work all day, make 16 pay her one of it and keep the other 15. Either that or he comes in, works one hour, does one tax return, charges that person $200 for it, gives Ashley one of it, and then he's got all the rest of the day. He's only worked one hour and he's got all the rest of the day to go do whatever he wants to do. That's what she should do. So what should happen? Ashley should let Barry do her taxes. Barry should let Ashley fix her plumbing. And then, as I said, even if it ain't about the money, maybe she works just does just enough sink repairs to make the money to pay him. He does just enough taxes to make the money to pay her. And then they take the rest of it in free time. So what they should do is find, where do I have a comparative advantage? What can I, Ashley, do that I have a smaller comparative sacrifice to bear? Then I'm going to specialize in that where I have these smaller sacrifices. And Barry is going to specialize in what he has the smaller sacrifice in. Now, this is where I'm going to turn. This is where I'm going to turn things over. Let's talk about Kathy. She can knock out a tax return in 30 minutes. She's twice as fast as Barry. Woo you go, girl. But she can fix a sink in 15 minutes, so she's what, four times faster than Ashley? Something like that. Girl got game. <laughs> There's your alliteration for you. She's got game. She's faster than Barry for taxes. She's faster than Ashley for plumbing. Does she have an absolute advantage? No. That's right. This is, is this an advantage? True. But in the realm of talking about comparative advantage, the answer is no. Ashley has a comparative advantage over Kathy for sinks. 
Ashley doesn't have to give up as many tax returns to do her sink as Kathy does. But Kathy doesn't have to give up as many as Barry does, so Kathy has a comparative advantage over Barry, but she doesn't have it over Ashley. Because, uh, do I have it on the next slide? Uh, yeah, right here. Kathy has to give up two sink repairs in order to do a tax return. Barry only has to give up one-eighth of a tax return. Barry's sacrifice to be an accountant is smaller than Kathy's. She's faster than he is, but he doesn't have to give up as much. Her choice on, am I going to be a plumber, am I going to be an accountant, is a harder decision than Barry's. It's pretty obvious. Barry needs to be a tax accountant. It's pretty obvious. Ashley needs to be a plumber. But it isn't so obvious for her, because she's good at both of them. Kathy only has to give up half of a tax return, but Ashley has only to give up a quarter of a tax return. Ashley's sacrifice is smaller. Which would you rather be? Ashley, Kathy, or Barry? Kathy! Yeah! But who has the smallest sacrifice? Oh. Ashley when it comes to sinks, Barry when it comes to taxes. Let me give you a slightly different example here. Okay. Who have I not picked out today? Love Lane, Bobby, Haley. Congratulations. Don't worry, Connor, I'm going to be coming back to you. Just kind of like, yeah, so far I've gotten up fairly late this semester, but it's just okay. Um, don't worry, I'm really going to nail you one day, I guess, just, just to be prepared. Um, okay, Lovely fills out college applications. She's graduating from here. She's filled out applications. She gets an acceptance letter from Longwood. You go, girl. Actually, I really only need to pick on two people. So, Haley, you're off, you're off the hook now. The only acceptance letter hey, uh, Loveline got was from Longwood. Bobby, he sent out applications all over the place. Bobby gets the acceptance letter from Harvard, gets the acceptance letter from Yale. And yet I'm here. What? <laughs> I said, and yet I'm here. And yet you're here outside. No, this is after you graduate here. How easy is Loveline's decision on what she's gonna, where she's gonna go to college? Pretty easy. Pretty easy. She's like, one and done, right? How easy is Bobby's decision? Not so much. Not so much. Who would you rather be? Bobby. Sorry, nothing against you, Lovely. But who has the advantage in decision making? How long is it going to take her to make a decision? Yeah, Two seconds. Yeah, no time. How long is it going to take him to make his decision? Days or weeks, right? Who has the easier time making the decision? Lovelyne. Who has the smaller sacrifice of giving up time to make the decision? Lovelyne. She has the comparative advantage there. Sorry, not because she's a better student. He's got more options, which complicates his life. <laughs> he's got the advantage in life because, hey, what's going to happen three, four years from now? He's going to be walking around with paperwork. He's got his name on it that says Harvard or Yale. Where, sorry, I mean, I love you too, Longwood, but she's going to be graduating with a piece of paper that says Longwood on it, right? I mean, that carries some weight, but not quite as much, right? So, in the eyes of the world, he's got the advantage, but comparatively, how easy is her decision? She can make her decision to move on and do other stuff. What's he got to do? He's got to do some road tripping in the summer to be going and visiting these schools and negotiating. Well, how much financial aid and scholarships will you give me? How much financial aid and scholarships will you give me? Uh, how big is the dorm room you're going to give me? What kind of, right? He's got a bunch of stuff he's got to do. That's comparative advantage. Her sacrifice is smaller. Her decision is smaller. Comparative advantage. Oh, oh, okay. Give me the name of a human being. I'm going to let y'all choose. George. George. Okay. George. He's in high school. This is George. George looks like if Brad Pitt and George Clooney had a child. 
that's what George looks like. Wow. Does that work for y'all? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, DNA cloning, okay, right, seriously. Okay. George, he's a captain in the football team. He's smart. He's got a bunch of the girls at the school are interested in him. How hard is this decision to make the decision on who he's going to date? Compared to, give you the name of another dude. Max. Max again. Max. Uh, let's face it. Max is about five foot two, and he has an IQ that's about fifty-two, and he's got the face of a fifty-two-year-old person, and he weighs about fifty-two pounds. And his shy around people, can't talk to people, can't do anything. But there's just one girl that will talk to him. How easy is his decision on who he's going to date? Pretty easy. Because how many options does he have? One. How about George? How easy is his decision? He's got to start thinking about things, weighing his pros, if he, and he, he, he's smart enough fellow, hopefully, weighing his pros and cons and starting to like, okay, well, this, you know, she offers this and this and this, that one offers this and this, this, and this is personality, and you've got to start comparing and contrasting, he's making an Excel spreadsheet and all that kind of stuff, because <laughs> dirty little secret, well, he, yeah, I said he was a smart fellow too, dirty little secret, he's a little bit of a nerd too. Any of you ever made an Excel spreadsheet to help you with your dating planning? You know, what? You did that. No, <laughs> Excel didn't exist when I was in high school. You just made a pros and cons list. No, because I was closer to Max. <laughs> I was significantly closer to Max. I was pretty invisible during my days. So, in the eyes of the world, who's got the advantage? George, but when it comes to making the decision, who's got the advantage? Max. So, Kathy does not have a comparative advantage. Kathy does not have an absolute advantage. Believe it or not, who has the absolute advantage? Barry. Barry has the absolute advantage when it comes to taxes, because nobody gives up less than him. Ashley has the absolute advantage when it comes to plumbing, because nobody gives up less than her. See how that's working? Yeah, but isn't she going to make, you know, a lot of taxes done in there? We're rounding her out in the next slide. If Barry, Kathy, and Ashley were the only three people, Ashley has that absolute advantage in sinks. Nobody gives up less than her. Barry has the absolute advantage in taxes. Nobody gives up less than her. So what should Kathy do? She's faster at sinks than Ashley. She's faster at taxes than Barry. What should she do? Because she doesn't really have the absolute advantage. What should she do? A little bit of math. <laughs> She should say, okay, well, I can do 16 taxes in a day at $200 a pop. I can make $3,200 a day's tax account. I could do 32 sinks in a day at $100 a piece. I can make $3,200 a day as a plumber. Well, the math worked out to a tie, but if one of these numbers was bigger than the other, guess what? Question answered, right? So now her decision is, okay, which makes her happier? The joy of riding around in a truck, going from home to home and helping people out in their time of need with their plumbing needs and that kind of stuff, or would she rather be working behind a desk and a computer, that kind of stuff, because she hates getting dirt and mud up underneath her fingernails, and that plumber's buddy's kind of annoying, and, right? What makes her happier is going to ultimately be the thing. Which would you rather do? We overall would like to be Kathy, right? It's good to be Kathy, but that doesn't necessarily mean she has the absolute advantage or even a comparative advantage here. Go with me? Yep. Okay, so, slightly different story. You have a group of, I don't know, like seven people, they're out on a boat, and they're like sailing along in the Pacific, and I don't know, a storm comes along, and their tiny ship gets tossed, and it runs ashore on this little island somewhere. <laughs> they find themselves shipwrecked. They find themselves shipwrecked on this island that's rather reminiscent of Connor's backyard. <laughs> it's 10 acres, but the other side of the, it's the other side of the world, yes. But this 10 acre island, well, you know, there's like nothing there, but lo and behold, there's, uh, you, know, you know, they're looking around, it's like, okay, we got some coconut trees, we got some banana trees. So, okay, and then the one bizarre thing is just the way the island is, you can only plant one tree per acre. 
okay? That's just to keep the math simple, okay? So, we ain't raising cows. We're not growing corn because we don't have corn. Did, did, did anybody go on vacation with corn seeds in their pocket? If you do, you got some bigger issues than, uh, <laughs> y'all got more problems than Jenny does, and we just established before class that girls got some issues. Or even just corn seeds, what about just seeds in general? Yeah, yeah just any kind of seeds. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, yeah, I mean, it's, you, I mean, if you go on a six month vacation, I can see a few people like Luke having a few seeds so they can have their little crops in the little window rule. But, you know, because Luke is our drug addict. But otherwise, not. If you're only going out for a few days or a week, you didn't know. Nobody's going with any seeds. So, plantable seeds, those have been killed. Yes. So, 10 acre farm, 10 acre island. You can only grow coconuts, you can only grow bananas, you can only get one tree per acre. So our production possibilities looks like this, because I kept it simple. You can either do 10 coconut trees, 10 banana trees. Did I do it? Maybe you can do five banana trees, five coconut trees, seven and two, eight and three, right? Ooh, seven and three, eight and two. <laughs> yes, those are your possibilities there. What would we do? Probably, like what we talked about, we probably would go half and half, half coconut trees, half banana trees. Half bananas. Coconuts are already good. Yeah, but let's just face it. We go nuts if all we had to eat was coconuts. We go bananas if all we had was bananas, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap joke for the semester. So I really want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we probably would end up with some kind of variety. Maybe we do six and four. Maybe we do four and six. But we're going to come down somewhere in the middle. We got to do a survey and ask all the people there. It's like. Okay, we got a couple old people with dentures and that kind of stuff, so maybe they're not going to be messing with the coconuts a whole lot or whatever. And then, then you know, the first mate, first mate of the ship, he's pretty skinny, so maybe he's not going to be able to chop open the coconut. Right? You got to see how things play out. But then there's the danger of you know leaving these banana peels laying around for the first mate to be stepping on and falling over and getting hurt. Y'all know who I speak, maybe. So. Somewhere along the line, they discuss it, they come up with their plan, and okay, well, we're gonna have five coconut trees, we're gonna have five banana trees, and that's what we have to work with. But, just over the horizon, that they can't see, because they don't have binoculars, there's another island. There's some people living on that island, native indigenous people of the Southern Pacific region. Um, they, they have a 10 acre island, and they can only grow coconuts and bananas as well. But their island is slightly more volcanic, and so it's more hilly and more rocky soil and that kind of stuff. So the way it works out is they need, they can only do one coconut tree per acre, but it takes them two acres to grow a banana tree. Because it's kind of hilly and whatever, so those roots really got to spread out to keep the tree from falling over because it's on a hill, right? I guess, okay? So let's run with it. They would need two acres for each banana tree or one acre for each coconut tree. So their production possibilities curve would look like this. Ten coconuts, no bananas, five bananas and no coconuts, or somewhere in between. And where would they probably find themselves at? <laughs> They'd probably do like a four or three. They could do a two and six. But that's probably about where they're going to end up with. They're going to be getting six, seven, eight trees worth of food, where the other island are getting ten trees worth of food off of their island. They have a hot bomb to eat. Yes. Well, the, the volcano is dormant at the moment. Okay. Just, <laughs> it ain't a big island of Hawaii, so they're doing okay at the moment. So. One day, these people on the other island, some of them get on a little boat because they, they see some smoke and whatever, so they get on their canoe thing and they like paddle along and they discover each other. And you know, who are those indigenous people from that other not other island? Y'all know who I'm talking about? No. Anybody? Nobody. Gilligan's Island. Oh. The TV show series. I mean, I, I know a couple of years ago, some people were like what, going back, watching it on YouTube or whatever. It's kind of one of those things that came back into the show in the 70s. I mean, I, I just didn't know that that's what you were referencing. Yes. Yes. Okay. I was thinking about <laughs> like Sims 2 Castaway the whole time. <laughs> about what? Sims 2 Castaway, like a oh. game. Okay. 
blah, blah, blah. But he said the Simpsons, and I'm like, well, okay, but okay. Um, so anyway, the, the, the people on the other island, they're, they're headhunters. They like, you know, cut your head off, stick it on spike. So you're, you're here, it's like you, you got this old millionaire couple, you've got a movie star, you've got this whatever, Iowa farm girl, you've got the skipper of the boat and his goofy first mate, and you're, there's the other guy there who's like professor, right? So this boat comes sailing up, and you got these people with war paint on their faces and they're carrying these sharp spears and carrying machetes and they got mean looks on their faces and that kind of stuff. And professor smart guy say, whoa, 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 whoa. You could kill us and take our food, but then you got a whole lot more work that you got to do. So let's kind of negotiate. Let's talk things through. Let's see if we can come up with something that's going to beneficially work out for both sides, and we get to keep our heads. Okay. So if we didn't negotiate, what would happen? So people on our island would plant five banana trees and five coconut trees. They would eat five banana trees, five coconut trees. But what the what happens is before they came across saw the smoke and came across the salt, they were planting three banana trees and four coconut trees. They were eating three banana trees and four coconut trees. Right. But what ends up happening is the professor, because he's a professor, he's gonna start you know pulling out his Excel spreadsheet. They don't have computers right then, but no. he's going to start pulling out the calculator or whatever. And he's going to say, so we've got a comparative advantage when it comes to bananas. Banana trees grow easier on our island than yours. So for us to go all in on growing bananas is easier than for y'all to go all in on bananas. But y'all have the comparative advantage when it comes to coconuts. For y'all to go in on, all in on coconuts, y'all don't have to give up as many banana trees as we would. So let's... Do what's smart. We'll do what we do best, what we have the advantage in, and let us grow nothing but bananas. And y'all grow nothing but coconuts, and then we do a trade. So then what ends up happening? We'll plant nothing but 10 banana trees, we'll eat five banana trees worth of stuff, and we'll give y'all five banana trees worth of bananas, and y'all give us five coconut trees worth of coconuts. So we're right back exactly where we were, but at least we got to keep our heads. But how about y'all? Ignore the black for a moment. But how about y'all? Y'all only have to plant 10 coconut trees, and you ain't trying to force growing banana trees where banana trees don't want to grow. And guess what? We'll trade, and y'all end up eating five bananas, five banana trees worth of bananas, five coconut trees worth of coconuts, which is better than you were before. Where you were getting three of the bananas and four of the coconuts, now you're getting five. Y'all get more coconuts, y'all get more bananas. We're exactly the same, but we're alive. We all get more. Or if they're, then the millionaire, Mr. Howell, he comes in and he starts driving the hard bar and blah. Well, how about you know, if we get six of the coconuts and six of the bananas, well, y'all get four and four. Well, that still is putting y'all into better shape than you were before. Four and four is better than four and three. And we got to get something. Do you risk it? Mm, I wouldn't push that one. Right? <laughs> you could start, yeah. You know, it's where the exact numbers come out depends on how the negotiation is. But if they do what they do best and we do what we do best, we go from having a total of 17 trees. Oh, I didn't put it there. We go from having a total of between the two of us, we go from having 17 trees worth of food to having 20 trees worth of food. That's more food. Using the same acreage with no bloodshed, we have more food for everybody. Yeah. Hmm? Souls have bananas delivered away in their Yep. This isn't too shabby of an idea here, right? This works. Let's finish this up. If there was prices involved, if we were messing with money, but we're not in this case, but if we were to mess with money, guess what? our prices would get to be lower because we're going to be more efficient producers because we don't have to have the banana team and the coconut team. We don't have to have special equipment for growing bananas and have special equipment for growing coconuts. We only need one set of equipment and we're not trying to grow something where it doesn't want to grow. 
They're not trying to grow something where it doesn't want to grow. So they're growing things, it's easier for them to grow. We're growing things, it's easier for us to grow. So neither side has to work as hard, which means we don't have to charge as high a price because our costs are down, prices will be lower because we're specializing and we're trading. Going back, Ashley, Barry doesn't have to jack the prices up on the few tax returns he does because he has to give up doing eight of them in order to fix his own sink. So if he does fixes his own sink, he's giving up, what was it, $1,500 worth of money or something like that? Well, he's got to make up that $1,500 somewhere else or he's going to be jacking up the prices he charges everybody else, right? But by specializing, let somebody else do the work, he doesn't have to do that. Prices will get lower because of the specializing and trading because we're more efficient. We get more of each product, more being produced, more getting enjoyed by both parties. Then there's the whole, I uh, can't remember if I have it on here, the variety thing. Oh, thank you. Okay, more choice and more variety. In this case, bananas and coconuts. Okay, they went from eating bananas and coconuts to eating bananas and coconuts. But think about what cars you would be driving if we were not trading with any other country in the world. You'd be driving some flavor of a Ford, some flavor of a Chevy, some flavor of a Dodge. How many of you have a car that doesn't fall under either of those three categories? Only three of you? How many of you don't drive? None of me? So Ford, Chevy, Honda. Okay, so you were wondering with a hand up, okay. Okay, she didn't drive, she didn't say, okay. Dodge, you said, yeah, Dodge, yeah. Mazda. Mazda. Mercury. Mercury, okay, that's a Ford flavor. Dodge. Dodge. Maybe I don't, I don't know what kind of is. Just a car. <laughs> <laughs> Dodge, right? Oh, remember when I talked about how he was, he was a special one that mom and dad were taking care of him and all that kind of stuff, paying all his bills and giving him transportation and all that kind of stuff. Apparently that was accurate like there. Congratulations. <laughs> Milk it as long as you can. I will. I know your parents <laughs> get on you ever loving last nerve, but I hope you ride that ride as long as you can, as long as you can. Keep them going to where you tip the balance, like where Jenny is, and where you're about ready to go socio and snap, and that kind of just don't quite go that far move out at that point. But okay. <laughs> we got more cars to choose from because we're dealing with other people. We've got more clothes to choose from because we're dealing with other people. How many, t what TV would you be watching? Like you, mean, you would not be watching TV because there is no TVs being made in America, period. It used to be, but not anymore. If we decided to stand at the borders, middle fingers in the air, we ain't trading with anybody anymore, guess what? The TV you got is the TV you got. Because we don't make them here. Somebody else made them cheaper, and we're like, well, we'll do something else instead. Our computer monitors, same thing. So be nice to your screen. So we get more of each product, and then more different products to choose from. Prices are lower, easier work situation. Don't have to work so hard to be trying to force banana trees to grow where they don't want to grow. You don't have to worry about the, if you're a coconut tree, coconut island, you don't have to worry about having all of these specialized equipment that it takes for growing bananas. You don't have to worry about bringing in, I'm loosening up the metaphor a little bit. You don't have to worry about bringing in banana specific uh, fertilizer for that part of it, coconut specific fertilizer for that part of it, had a different spreaders. You got to rinse everything out when you do the, one weed killer on one side, then you spray the different weed killer on you. It's easier when you just have the one set of tools, the one set of fertilizer, the one set of trucks, the one set of stuff. And guess what? Okay, so we don't have to work so hard to be planning all of this stuff because we're growing what grows easiest for us. So instead of having uh, the seven of us, instead of having two people working on a coconut farm, two people working on a banana farm, well, maybe we're going all in on coconuts. Maybe we have three people doing the coconuts and we actually freed up another person that we can use to help build the boat that we're going to use to escape from this island, right? So you get an easier work situation. We get world peace because we're growing their food for them. They're less likely to kill us. <laughs> we have, and just uh, bringing it back to local, Luke, Generally gets strung out on heroin an interesting amount of the week, an interesting amount of the month. 
So every once in a while, he's got to, he doesn't have enough money to really feed his habits. So every once in a while, he's got to like, you know, go rob a convenience store, store somewhere. Well, how likely is it that he, how likely is he to rob the gas station is right down the street from his house, the one that he fills up his car at three times a week? That's going to be the last one he robs, right? Because he knows the people, he does business with them. And he doesn't want to run them out of business because then that might make his life that much harder in the future. So what's he going to do? He's going to ride to the next town over and rob one of those gas stations, right? We don't rob people we do business with. We don't cheat people we do business with. We don't kill people we do business with. So just by trading, that helps us get world peace. We're not standing there being selfish. No, what's mine is mine and what's yours, well, pff, I don't care. Instead, well, I've got stuff, I'll share with you, you share with me, you give me money, I give you money, whatever, we're working together because we're all on this giant orb floating around the sun all together and we're in this thing together, just but you, you get world peace. So those of y'all that are, you know, hippies or whatever, boom, trade works. <laughs> and ultimately, we get more efficient. 20 trees worth of food out of 20 acres instead of only 17. That's more efficient. We only need one set of coconut tools, not two sets. Only one set of banana tools, not two sets. Which brings us to, it's better for the environment. For you hippies and Democrats, there you go. It's better for the environment to do this. Because if we weren't trading, they're going to be having to use, force all these extra chemicals and fertilizers and all that kind of junk into the soil to try to force bananas to grow where bananas don't want to grow. But you ain't got to force it, and you don't have to be polluting and whatever with all this extra stuff and then having to run off just going out there and killing all the fish in the water and all that kind of yeah. It's easier. It's easier on the land. It's easier on the environment. It's easier for everything when we're trading. Okay, and if you don't buy that one, well, is war good for the environment? No. no. So if we can help cut down on the number of wars we have, then we start cutting down on a number of, like, huge bullets, you know, bullet holes and that kind of stuff laying around here and there and nuclear waste from the nuclear bomb, the radiation from the nuclear weapons that are going off because of the war with North Korea because they can do us too. Right? <laughs> So, world peace is better for the environment. More efficient production is better for the environment. And we freed up people, easy work situation, to some people that can concentrate on doing something else. That maybe some of them can dedicate their lives to working for the environment. They can do other stuff. Think like Google. They make a crap ton of money on advertising. And they take some of that money and they do good things with it. Facebook, maybe not so much. Apple, they make a crap ton of money off of selling us cell phones, and they take some of that money, and they do good things with it. You get that kind of stuff where if, without the trade, without doing business, without doing business, they wouldn't have had that money, they can't do the stuff to help the environment. Ben and Jerry's ice cream, they make a bunch of money off of ice cream, and they take some of it, and they're helping do good things with it, helping the environmental causes and that kind of thing. If they couldn't do business, they couldn't sell ice cream, they wouldn't make the money to, they wouldn't have the money to turn around and help fix the environment. Trade is good across the board. I'll be honest with you here, I don't know what. I'm kind of politically conservative. The whole, uh, the whole idea of, you know, you do what you want to do and stay out of the way, let me do what I want to do as long as you're not victimizing me and I'm not victimizing you. But I believe in helping other people when they're in need and that kind of stuff. But if anything, I, I like the idea of smaller government, get out of the way, you know. But I have issues with what's going on in D.C. at the moment. I have issues where Trump is like going out there with middle fingers in the air saying, no, 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 let's slow down trade, let's make trade harder because we're reversing all of this. We don't want people to hate us. We need to be working with them. We need to be helping them, not standing there with our middle fingers in the air. Right? After we just opened trade with, um, didn't we lift the embargo on Cuba? Yeah, we lifted it. In the Obama administration, we lifted the, just said Cuba. We lifted the embargo on Cuba for maybe a year and a half, but then they're clamping down on it again. It's like, like Cuba's really a threat to us. 
<laughs> anyway, but <laughs> I've, I've liked Republicans, Democrats alike for 40 years, 50 years worth of middle fingers toward Cuba. It's like, well, we're going to exclude trading with Cuba because we don't like their communist government, we don't like Castro, and maybe if we make life hard enough for the people, they'll rise up and they'll throw those leaders out and put in new leaders. Well, after 50 years, if it ain't working, maybe we ought to try something different. I'm just saying, but that's Republicans and Democrats both to blame on that one, so there's plenty of blame to go around for everybody. I hate everybody, if you hadn't noticed yet. <laughs> but overall, the benefits for trade kind of outweigh the good. The complaint that Trump has is, well, they're making more money off of the trade than we are. And that ain't fair. He's sort of complaining. If I can go back to this. We went from having five coconut trees, five banana trees, to having five coconut trees, five banana trees. They're the ones getting all the benefits. How's that fair? That's the complaint. But we still have our heads, so. But part of the thinking, it's more than just this. It's more than just about that. The number one thinking for my story was about keeping our heads. It's more than just us getting more food in our bellies. There's more to it than that. And then there's the, if we can make them better off. If China wasn't trading with anybody, China would be, they've got, if you go more than about 50 miles inland from the, east coast of China, you're talking nothing but mountains. So there ain't a whole lot of productivity or anything going on once you go more than about 50 miles east. Pretty much from then on, it's just family farms. And so you're growing up, living in a house that daddy built, wearing clothes that mama made, and you're working for mom and dad, paying you nothing but the house that you're living in and the food that you're eating, right? So you're living, you're surviving, that's it. So do those people have money to be buying our stuff? No. But if we do trade with them, if we buy stuff from them, yep, we're buying more of their stuff than they're buying of our stuff, so there's more money going into China than there is coming out of China, and that's part of the complaint. There's more jobs getting cut in the U.S. than being gained in the U.S. because of trade. That's the problem. But the good thing is, is well, okay, you've got these people in China that I'm no longer wearing clothes that Mama made me or I made myself. I actually have enough money I can buy some food that mama didn't make that we didn't grow on a farm. I can actually buy some clothes that were made by somebody else. I can actually move to the city and I can get an apartment. I can get a bicycle, eventually maybe get a car, get a cell phone, get this kind of stuff. When you first get money, you're going to be buying it, spending it on the basics. That's what a lot of them are doing now. They're getting you know, basic food, basic clothing, basic shelter, but then they're going to, as their quality of life improves, they be getting more, they be getting more, they be getting more. Think about what it is you're spending your money on when you first move out, if you haven't already moved out from your parents yet. First thing you could be doing is you could be going to Walmart, you could be buying some crap so you can do your dishes and that kind of thing, nothing exciting, right? You could be buying some ramen noodles you can put on a shelf so you got something to eat, nothing exciting. But then as you get on your feet and you get a job and you get a paycheck and that kind of stuff, you're going to go from eating ramen noodles and eating with plastic forks and stealing packs of sauce from Taco Bell to actually eating better, that kind of stuff. So the plan is right now they're getting started, but what's going to be happening 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Once they've gone beyond the basics, they've handled all of their needs, they're going to start looking to satisfy their wants. And who's the king of the toys? The United States, metaphorically speaking. All the game, all the video games, all the movies, all that kind of stuff. We're leaking money to them now, but it's going to come back in 20 years. You think of it kind of as an investment, and oh, along the way, we check all of these, seriously, please don't. <laughs> we check all of these boxes too, not counting whatever them other boxes are that just popped up. You can play the short game, or you can play the long game. But, and it's usually actually bizarrely enough, it's the Democrats who are like, we've got to look at the short game. But Trump is looking short game. During the transition, there are people getting victimized. There are people that lost their jobs around here. They can't find something else around here. So what do we do with them? Well, sorry, I guess you got to move. To where the jobs are, well, it kind of sucks if, like, you have a husband and wife, 
They've got a couple kids here and one of them loses their job and they can't find a job, but they can't afford to sell the house and move to Raleigh or move to Richmond because the other one has a job and they've got the couple kids and they can't afford for that one to quit and they have not to have any income for however long it's gonna to take for them to sell the house, move to Richmond and buy a new house for the two of them to find a job. So we kind of got to look out for the people that are getting lost in the transition because that transition period while all this is happening is having a toll on people. Getting down to a girl who was in my last class, she kind of got victimized, lost her other job. She's got this other job that's not going to start for another like six weeks. Pretty good job that she's got coming up that's going to start in six weeks. She's not making but any more She's got to figure out how in the world she's not going to lose everything that she's got in the six weeks while she's waiting for that job to start. She's in a very tough space here for just two or six weeks. And it's like she can come up with, I don't know, a couple thousand. I don't know what she needs to get through those next couple of months. We, so we got to be conscious of that along the way. It ain't smooth. It ain't easy. The Okay, we had two people making coconuts, two people making bananas, and now we got three people making coconuts. So they, they hired one of our banana growers, but then one of our banana growers is out of work. We need to find something else for them to do. We can't just ignore them and say, sorry. Something needs to happen with them too. You, know, you get all of these benefits, these are work situations, but you lose jobs, which I think is on the next slide that we'll have to talk about next time. But you gotta keep your eye out for that transition there too. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, we went off on a couple of journeys, and we all are officially, if you weren't here before class, we all should be officially scared of Jenny and be extra nice to her because, anyway. Uh, see y'all have a good Labor Day weekend, and see you back here Tuesday.